Thanks for joining us. We're going to talk about Bitcoin rationalism. So my name is Stefan Levera. I host the Stefan Levera podcast. I'll just uh, ask my panelists to just take a minute and uh, introduce yourselves. Um, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Lily. Um, I uh, most recently had a company called Earn.com in this space. I um, sold it a little over a year ago to Coinbase um, and have been doing you know, the crypto thing for a number of years now. Prior to that, Polar Opposite built a hospital uh, in China, worked at KKR, worked at McKinsey. So, uh, so you know, travel the spectrum here. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's great to be here. Hey guys, I'm uh, Arjun, um, former engineer, um, investor in the space, kind of long time over the last you know four or five years. Um, I've written and, and researched um, extensively in the space, mostly focusing on uh, governance and, and kind of security. Uh, now I'm an investor at a venture capital firm in, in San Francisco called Paradigm, um, and that's me. Fantastic, thank you. All right, so we're talking about Bitcoin rationalism, and I believe, Lily, you may have been either the one to coin the term or perhaps popularize the term. So let's have from both of you, starting with you, Lily, obviously, what is Bitcoin rationalism? Um, well, to me, uh, it was just a very simple way of trying to articulate why Bitcoin. Um, you know, I found myself uh, speaking with a number of people who are perhaps new to the crypto space, and obviously there are a lot of things that were happening and a lot of attention that the whole space was getting. Uh, I had a number of people really you know, try to ask me, why Bitcoin, right? Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, uh, for me, there's a, a fairly sort of straightforward and pretty convincing kind of reason of why Bitcoin uh, and, you know, why this is likely to be sort of the most um, valuable asset in, you know, this asset class, if you consider an asset class. Um, and, uh, and, you know, really articulating sort of the, the idea that um, money is something that has a massive network effect, right? It's extremely sticky. That network effects uh, crosses borders, crosses generations. Um, and, uh, and is, you know, in many ways sort of the stickiest social network out there and is very likely to sort of actually accrue those um, ironically sort of centralizing uh, tendencies around value creation over time, right? Um, and, uh, and I find myself, you know, sort of telling that to a number of uh, folks and realizing that, you know, some of the, some of the popular um, terms, memes, kind of culture around Bitcoin uh, and crypto was actually not very accessible to a number of people who were curious about it. Um, and so uh, that's, you know, why I thought of the term Bitcoin rational was really sort of thinking more objectively about, um, about why Bitcoin and articulating that to a lot of people who are interested. Arjun? I think, uh, you know, I, I would plus one almost everything that Lily said. I think in addition to that, you know, the, um, you know, one of the really interesting things about watching uh, the development of Bitcoin over the last several years has actually been uh, a lot of the positive externalities that have come out of it, uh, you know, namely in uh, research into, um, you know, other areas of cryptography, um, you know, a lot of research that's, uh, and resources that's gone into uh, focusing on privacy. Uh, I think coming out of this has actually been a number of, um, you know, almost uh, adjacencies that are really interesting um, and of, you know, of generative value to Bitcoin, uh, you know, including, uh, you know, kind of decentralized markets uh, in, in kind of non, uh, you know, Bitcoin resources uh, and prediction markets broadly, I think, are, are very compelling. Um, new ways of, you know, capital formation or like corporate organization, I think, are are really interesting as well. And uh, you know, one of the one of the things uh, that you know you tend to see with uh, a lot of the the sort of really uh, insiders, so to speak, in the Bitcoin community is that um, you know there's there's a, a lot of focus on Bitcoin uh, to the exclusion of a lot of this other interesting these other kind of interesting developments. So I think that uh, one way that I think about it is that it's a reframing of you know, what, maintaining the descriptive view that, um, you know, non-sovereign money potentially has uh, the largest possible market in anything that people are working on in crypto as a broad category, but that, you know, a number of other developments could be value creative to Bitcoin as well. Right. It might be interesting then to maybe distinguish there between monetary versus technology. And I think you, you might both have interesting comments on that because what has perhaps happened in, in the industry over the years is people have perhaps have confused the two. What's your view? Uh, well, you know, the term you hear a lot is programmable money. Um, and, uh, and 
I think it's important to sort of really even just think about the part of speech in that term, right? The noun here is money, and the modifier, the adjective, is programmable. Um, and so, you know, fundamentally, um, so the many principles and sort of the rules of money really apply. Um, and, you know, the technology sort of distributed ledger, um, uh, in this case, the Bitcoin blockchain, is uh, is the new technology, which actually gives you new use cases, makes it sort of newly accessible. Uh, and there's also sort of really new and really interesting things that you can do with money now, right? But first and foremost, this is about money, which means things like, you know, number one, price really matters. Um, and, you know, I think if you even just sort of see the energy and the sort of, um, and the sentiment that's changed dramatically when Bitcoin was 3,000 versus 10,000, um, I think price is incredibly relevant. Uh, and then, you know, number two, um, things like, you know, uh, having a sort of stable money supply is really important. And just because, you know, uh, if there's 2,000 tokens that all sort of print um, a stable supply of money individually, but there's 2,000 sort of competing for privacy, then you're just not going to be able to have price stability, much less token appreciation, right? Um, so, you know, I think first and foremost, this, what's going to be valuable in uh, this ecosystem has to do with... Um, money-based applications and new ways of using money. Uh, I think that a lot of the um, ideas around um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the R&D that's gone to smart contracting platforms, um, uh, as a user, I'm universally thrilled about because previously that's the type of work that was being funded, you know, let's say, an NSF grant 500k for five years uh, and was sort of, you know, in a corner of the ivory tower. And now at the very least, we sort of found a way um, as a society, as a community to sort of put a lot more um, resource into doing really important R&D, right? Um, so as a user, I'm universally thrilled about it. Um, as an investor, um, I think it's, you know, much less clear uh, if and how that's going to be valuable. Um, and so therefore, I think it's just, I think it's pretty important to sort of distinguish between the money parts of this, right? Um, and, and the technology side of this. I think that the, the sort of broad, uh, you know, mo is it money or is it technology uh, bifurcation when it comes to crypto? I actually, um, you know, don't find super useful. I, I think that, you know, if you take Bitcoin, Bitcoin is both. Bitcoin is sort of this hybrid, um, you know, monetary technology where the technological aspects of the system are inseparable from the thing that makes it valuable, right? So, you know, Bitcoin has a monetary status, um, you know, in a global macro context, but at the same time, you know, it's, uh, Bitcoin's price itself is very important, uh, you know, to its security model. Uh, and so, you know, broadly, when I think people uh, try to use this um, sort of like binary, um, you know, sort of, sort of bifurcation with, um, mon with money and technology, uh, I think that they use it to try to delineate a difference between, um, say, Bitcoin and everything else, right? So I think, you know, one common one, uh, you know, common discussion that's been going on, I think, for the last, you know, 18 to 24 months is, you know, is Ether money. For example, you know, is it is really different from Bitcoin, uh, you know, in, in that it's kind of this useful token, or is it, um, you know, kind of the, like some sort of, uh, you know, very similar uh, system, maybe like a superset of the system? I think that, you know, these, these framings are really difficult, uh, you know, because they, they are really different, uh, but at the core of it, you know, ultimately, all of these uh, tokens that are, that are sort of unpegged tokens, I think, are competitive monies in some form. And the fact that their value, you know, isn't zero, means that the market has recognized uh, across some set of trade-offs that they have that that they find it, you know, valuable in some way. I think that, you know, in the context uh, of you know something like Ethereum, I think that you know there's different uh, there's different trade-offs to be made about you know with the potential utility of the system or the trade-off of it having a different security model. Uh, I think that there's a lot of people that, you know, and, and empirically, if you look at the, the market, the, the, si the relative sizes of the market cap, um, I think that there's a lot of people who, di who would disagree with this set of trade-offs. But ultimately, I think that the, the kind of hero's journey for all, uh, you know, sort of these hybrid technology money systems, I think the hero's journey and the, the sort of pathing to uh, the end goal, which is, you know, trying to build uh, a very, very secure, um, you know, base layer money system that could be, you know, global reserve currency. I think that that pathing looks virtually identical for, uh, you know, all 
cryptocurrencies, you know, what, 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 regardless of the kinds of trade-offs they're, they're making. Insofar as that's true, I actually don't find the, you know, the focus on money or uh, the focus of, you know, uh, monetary policy uh, or the security of the monetary policy versus, uh, you know, the, the utility that the system provides. I actually don't find that that's like a useful, um, you know, sort of like binary categorization. Um, but I do think that, you know, it's useful to consider that the, the end pathing is similar for all of these systems, but, um, you know, the, what we consider plausible or what we consider valuable might depend on individual perception of the trade-offs that each system is making. Um, I, mean, I feel like um, there, there is certainly a lot of innovation, a lot of um, like really brilliant uh, kind of work which is being done in the space. Um, but sometimes I just wonder, um, you know, when you think about who's going to win in the space or which kind of chain, if you will, which project is going to win in the space, um, I actually wonder a little bit um, how much of that incremental technological innovation is actually going to impact that outcome. Because um, I think what is sort of an overwhelming force um, in this industry right now, because this is about money, which is like sort of this universally appealing, obviously very large market, um, you know, I, I just feel like Bitcoin is imperfect in you know, many ways, technologically speaking, fine. Um, but it's got sort of the, um, it's got the brand, it's got the regulatory blessing, and uh, for what it seeks to do, um, it is technologically sufficient and is sort of head and shoulders above on all of those other dimensions, right? So um, when you think about it from that perspective, um, it's, it's hard to see how um, you know, something else is going to be able to compete um, with that from, you know, just perspective of, of gaining share, gaining market share. Uh, and that's, you know, really, um, to me, why, again, the money in the markets perspective on this uh, in many ways kind of is the primary and in many, in many circumstances is going to dominate um, any sort of technological superiority, innovation, whatever it else it might be, because just like sort of the tailwinds when you're thinking about a money that um, is, you know, uh, the, the leader to sort of denominate um, the digital world, right, um, is something once it gains adoption, then it becomes borderless very quickly and sort of cross-generation, which is even stronger than, you know, social networks, which have been incredibly successful. Uh, so when I look at all of that, um, that to me is kind of the biggest story around. And it's a very simple story as well, which means it can be a very big story because it's something millions, if not billions of people can really get behind. Right. Yeah, so it, fascinating comments there, uh, Arjun, around competitive monies and some of the characteristics. I think an interesting question as well, and perhaps this is a common point of contention or debate, some people consider, is money a belief system or is it more like it's subjectively perceived but it's not arbitrary, that some you know, monies have better characteristics? What you, what's your perspective on that? Uh, I mean, there's some base characteristics that have to exist, right? So, you know, you can have a number of people believe in a money, but um, if that money supply is being doubled or tripled on a daily basis, which is happening in some parts of the world, then it's pretty hard to sort of maintain that belief over time. Um, and so there's kind of like a, a basic set of features that have to exist. Um, but then, you know, what, uh, what really uh, is the most important thing uh, to make sort of money actually useful is that you can use it, right? So you can actually use it to get something that you really want in the other direction. Um, and so that's, you know, what just makes this, makes the network effect self-reinforcing in a very, very strong way. Um, so, uh, so I don't know whether that makes it, uh, there's certainly aspects of, um, of the community that we're all in that have, you know, a very strong component of belief and faith. That's absolutely true. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that's been, you know, really magical for the space and has gotten us to, you know, where we are now 10 years later. Um, but uh, I think that what's going to get you from, you know, the 100K to million, the 50 million, the 100 million, or like several billion um, is not faith, right? Um, it's actually sort of aligning people's self-interest because um, that's really the only thing that can scale very quickly to four billion people, right? Trying to maintain a system of faith requires a lot of sort of hearts and minds onboarding and a high degree of mutual trust. And that's almost impossible to sort of build 
um, in such a large community in a short period of time because it's basically you know, a function of trust. And I think that, at least for me, is one of the most uh, interesting things um, in, in Bitcoin that it basically you know, recognizes that um, trust is a function of time and therefore it scales relatively linearly. Um, and so if you do away with that as a necessary component of organizing communities, um, then you can scale really quickly, right? And so use uh, incentives or money as a way of sort of coordinating large and potentially anonymous or pseudonymous groups of people. Uh, and that to me is like one of, the, one of the greatest insights that you should just accept that people are inherently sort of uh, self-interested and that's okay. Yeah, Ajay? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with the view that, you know, at, at the core of this is, um, you know, sort of this uh, collective perception um, and that, you know, the, you know, the sort of re re the relative values of large uh, cryptocurrencies generally reflect uh, everybody's confidence in this uh, kind of like shared delusion. I think that there, um, you know, I think uh, a potentially like more useful thread to explore, uh, which a lot of people have been, you know, trying to explore for the last several years is, you know, what makes uh, kind of good money in this context uh, and sort of what the, you know, how we should think about the criteria for, you know, what we consider, uh, you know, the, the best possible contender uh, for uh, a global money system. I think that, you know, in the life cycle of that, I think we're actually still very, very early. Um, and so we, and we, and we, the, the, the ideals that we hold, uh, you know, true to what we consider valuable, I think it's still evolving over time. I think uh, one of the things that, you know, a lot of people, I think, especially in the, um, in, you know, in, in the world of Bitcoin consider uh, kind of at the, the top of the list is uh, security of the system and more specifically, you know, security of uh, the monetary policy. I think that you know there there are a lot of uh, decisions about you know how Bitcoin's uh, security model uh, you know works, the ethos of the system of you know uh, verification over trust. Uh, I think that the, um, the and the sort of conservativeness, the relative conservativeness, I should say, of the core development team. I think a lot of these things reflect what the you know community holds uh, very true to heart about what makes for a good uh, monetary system. I think that with you know, other competitors, there's, there's other potential trade-offs uh, that, that have been considered. I think it remains to be seen uh, which of these will contribute most effecti effectively to the shared delusion. Um, you know, I think that consistent with uh, what we've seen, I think that you know, security and, and uh, you know, the sanctity of the monetary policy, I think, will, be, will, will definitely be high up on the list. Excellent answer. How about now technologies and businesses' ideas that, you know, they're not necessarily competing with Bitcoin, they're building on top of Bitcoin, or they're using Bitcoin in some way. Uh, how do you, uh, where do you view the stage that we're at right now, uh, and you know, what are you sort of looking forward to there? Um, so folks who are building, so for example, Lightning and the ecosystems yeah. being developed around that. Um, I think it's uh, fantastic for uh, for Bitcoin and for the community. Um, I I don't think it's uh, actually it, it helps it helps Bitcoin become more valuable. But Bitcoin is very likely to become more valuable, irrespective of how much is actually being built on top of Bitcoin or not, because it has this sort of vaunted position um, and sort of mutual belief that it is something like digital gold, where simply having it and holding it is sufficient, right? Uh, and so I think it's um, great that folks are building upon it and finding ways um, to sort of to actually create sort of more live uh, economies around it. I think one of the challenges is simply that no one wants to be the 10,000 Bitcoin pizza person, right? Um, and uh, uh, and you know uh, those so those types of things to me you know store value and mean of exchange at this point in time um, this could be very different ten, 10 years from now but at this point in time are a little bit of competing priorities because I would say that there is a shared belief that uh, that Bitcoin is going to appreciate pretty dramatically over time. Um, so on one hand, I think it's fantastic the infrastructure is being built. Um, I wonder if the market is really ready to use it simply because I think people are going to want to hold on to their coins and spend other things. Yeah, yeah I think that, the, you know, again, here, I think there's a useful, um, you know, delineation that could be made between, um, you know, businesses that use Bitcoin, right? For example, you know, they, there might be a business that uses Bitcoin 
uh, for payments because they you know, are kind of uniquely disadvantaged by the existing uh, payment or banking uh, rails. And so, you know, here you see, um, you know, mostly I think uh, most of the, the sort of businesses that have traction here are all, you know, in kind of an illicit category, you know, whether it's, you know, online, you know, pornography or, uh, you know, online gambling or, or, or things like that. And uh, businesses that are attempting to offer, uh, businesses or projects that are attempting to offer a kind of uh, a novel, uh, you know, type of offering that's uniquely enabled by uh, the Bitcoin infrastructure. I think in the former camp, we're actually, you know, pretty far ahead uh, insofar, uh, insofar as, um, you know, people generally don't want to spend their Bitcoin. Uh, I think we're uh, pretty far ahead uh, in terms of the businesses where, uh, you know, people need Bitcoin in order to access it, you know, in some of the categories that I described. I think in the latter category, we're still in like the very, very early innings, um, you know, namely because historically we, there hasn't been, uh, you know, a ton of expressiveness. Uh, in terms of the, the sort of primitives that Bitcoin gives you to, to work with via script. I think we're starting to get there because, you know, Lightning has launched. You know, Lightning is a year, you know, into, a year plus into its development, and we're starting to see uh, a lot of the, you know, the early tooling that, uh, you know, developers need to build applications with Lightning uh, come to market. And there's a lot of really, uh, you know, promising proof of concepts there. I think that, uh, you know, there we're going to see, I think, uh, increasingly more sophisticated uh, applications because, you know, what we have at the core of it, um, you know, which is a highly predictable, highly secure uh, base layer protocol, uh, I think is an extremely compelling uh, stack for developers to work with. So I think that, you know, we're there in terms of applications that are uniquely enabled by Bitcoin. I think we're still very, very uh, early on in the life cycle, but it's something that I think um, all signs show is very promising. Excellent. How about this idea of building a parallel financial system on top of Bitcoin? How do you view that versus trying to make the existing financial system come along with us for the ride? I mean, uh, to build a parallel financial system means um, different things to different people. For some folks, that means you know a purely you know fully decentralized. Um, uh, lending model, bar, uh, um, you know, uh, derivatives kind of exchange and those sorts of things. Um, uh, whereas to others, a parallel financial model could mean something as kind of simple and incremental as having digital wallets rather than having to trudge to the bank and deal with cash, right? And then there's many other definitions in between. Um, I think it goes without saying that, um, you know, sort of the uh, the friction between essentially sort of a country-based um, monetary system um, is something that um, you know creates a number of costs and in inefficiencies, uh, both in terms of time and money, um, that ultimately sort of fall on the shoulders of um, of folks who are trying to sort of make it the most, right? Um, so, uh, so I think that there's a number of different ways um, that you know crypto broadly defined as making inroads into that, um, you know facilitating um, both B2C, C2C, C2B, C2, uh, those various forms of, of payments or remittance is kind of on one end, and then there's sort of the more um, avant-garde form of it, which is you know, these purely sort of peer-to-peer -peer decentralized uh, financial systems. Uh, and then there is you know, something a little bit in the middle, which is you know, as simple and easy that anyone can do, which is you know, let's say buying and holding uh, Bitcoin or another crypto asset. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the, you know, I think that a lot of the tooling uh, in, in the sort of like quote unquote parallel financial system that you could build, uh, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of activity there, uh, but historically I think it's gotten a little bit of flack, uh, you know, from Bitcoiners because it's mostly been centered on, you know, other public blockchains. But I think that, you know, slowly we're starting to see a lot of activity there, um, you know, whether it's in uh, synthetics products. Um, you know, one of my colleagues, Dan Robinson, wrote a paper uh, earlier this year outlining how synthetics could be uh, issued on, you know, via lightning channels, um, you know, whether it's uh, those types of products or uh, in prediction markets or uh, capital formation. I think that uh, a lot of these products are now being explored and I think a very integral part of, um, you know, whatever system uh, we end up, you know, whatever system state we end up reaching in the future, uh, just because a lot of these products are, you know, essential to, uh, you know, to making the entire uh, financial experience more accessible to consumers. Fantastic. Well, look, that, I think that's pretty much all we've got time for. So please put your hands together for our panelists, Lily and Arjun.